Hi, everybody. I just want to introduce myself before I have my friend uh, Rick come up to join us. Um, so I um, was involved with uh, Adopt Your Own Ministry, as Bill mentioned earlier, back in 2011 when it started. And um, I was just reflecting on who was with me that time. And this picture you see on the left is my wife. And uh, she joined me there that day. But who are not in that picture were my kids. In 2011, I brought my 13-year-old and 16-year-old also with me. And uh, they did some of this work with me uh, for a number of years. And so uh, I'll share a bit more about that later, uh, about that. But um, let me just first say just two things before I invite Rick to come up here and join me. Is that, um, you know, I was born and raised in San Francisco. The first four years of my life, I lived two doors from the building that Bill and Patty minister at. My parents owned the lawn. My parents were immigrant parents. And they had a laundry mat two doors from where the building Crescent Manor was. And I lived there for four years until I moved out to the Sunset District here in San Francisco. And then I later on, became a, as I became an adult, moved out to Millbrae, started my life, career, um, in biotech, did that for 24 years. And I'm here today in front of you. And, um, so I'm going to quickly accelerate some of that and just try to share about you know how God really, and in each of our lives, there's a unique story for all of you to, to, to live out. And I can I have nothing but joy to share with you this, this, this morning, this afternoon, uh, about, about how that kind of looks in my life. And so with that, I want to invite my friend Rick to come up and join me. Let's give him a hand. So Rick and I, um, I can really clearly remember in my head the first time we met. I remember, Rick, you were wearing 49er sneak slippers in the lobby of your building. And we were watching and doing a little a lunch party uh, in this building uh, through the Dr. Bill. Well, those were uh, those house slippers. House slippers. <laughs> yeah, they were. Yeah. <laughs> they were. And so, um, so Rick and I have known each other for a while. And I wanted to invite Rick today because he's just so, uh, he has just a remarkable story to share with you. And, um, I hope that you get something out of it, some takeaways for, for each of you in different ways. So with that, uh, let me start with this. Rick, why don't you share a little bit about yourself and what brought, what was your journey like coming to San Francisco? Well, um, when I was 23, after I got out of prison in Florida, I, uh, I said, you know, it's about enough of this state. <laughs> let me go check out California. So uh, I came out to California. To live with my brother, who was stationed on Treasure Island, so I ended up staying with him for a month. And then maybe just um, go back just a little bit about where you like, grew up, and maybe talk a little about that. Uh, I grew up in uh, Florida, Lake City, Florida. And, uh, I <clears throat> was living with my dad, but he had a heart attack, and after he had a heart attack, I went back to my mom. And we ended up getting taken away and put in uh, a shelter system. And uh, the lady that was uh, running the shelter, she was born again Christian. So I was able to get saved and baptized and right before I turned 12 years old. And, uh, and so from there, what, what, what? Hey, Matt. And so what happened after that, Rick? So after that, um, ended up being adopted by a family in the church. And uh, so my brother ended up staying with that family. But uh, I left when I was like uh, 13. But my brother ended up staying with the family. And I want you to share a little bit about the kind of changes that happened after that, right? With you and your brother, some, some things happened. Right? Oh, yeah. Me you and know, my brother, we had a falling out. And I had to come out here to, to stay with my brother. Um, me and his wife got into an argument and she threw me off the base. <laughs> so, you know, I took my stuff, and, but I had got a job like a week before that with, um, with Casanova's Restaurant, Fisherman's Wharf. So I had worked it out to, I had a place to stay. So, yeah. And then what happened? And you share a bit what with me what happened after that. Good, good job in your, that. Oh, 
then I got into a, a crazy relationship, and uh, that like spiraled me into a, like a down downhill. Um, it was horrible. It was horrible. My life went just downhill. I was in and out of jail a lot, and uh, just started like a, a couple of year bad, a bad, uh, a bad time. I mean, you know, you're, you're in and out of San Quentin. So how how long did you? Oh, uh, I was like in and out of San Quentin for like five years. You know, going to parole. And then uh, my uh, my parole officer, <laughs> he goes, "Yeah, man." You, you, I've sent you back more times than anybody else. Yeah, he was bragging about it. <laughs> I was like, man, I give up. Finally, at the at last, my last violation, I said, you know what, man, I I got to beat them at their own game, man. So I just like picked up my whole act and, and got up off the parole, man. But um, it was hard. Yeah, it was hard. It was God's hard. Yeah, and so from that, after you have kind of figure things out a bit better uh, at the end of your journey at some point. You said that some things happened there that you mentioned. Oh, yeah. I was on the street for like two years when I first got out. And, uh, and then I ended up, uh, I had a, a girlfriend that was going to talk to the hot team. So I said, you know what? Let me just go with you and support you. <laughs> you know? And, uh, so I went for the so for for those of you who don't know the hot teams, the homeless outreach team. Homeless outreach, yeah. The homeless outreach team here in the city. And uh so I went with her and uh just to support her. And uh I was just sitting sitting there and one of the other workers came up and was talking with me. Next thing I know I'm getting put into a unit <laughs> and I get my own place, right? So yeah, so it worked out not too long after that. That's where I met this guy. I'm knocking on my door. <laughs> so you went really through the system in an accelerated manner. Like you went yeah. from out of something and, and really figuring things out. And then you know, just a momentary time of, uh, you know, of homelessness. And then you found shelter through this great coincidence of meeting this friend. And then you landed at Alma, we met. Uh, so talk a little bit about that. I like, guess uh, you know, our, you know, our friendship and just our relationship. You know, how, like, how did that? Affect you. How was it with a stranger knocking on your door, <laughs> you know, and, and saying, you know, uh, I was like I went down to him, look, man, you got to keep this guy away from you. <laughs> no, I mean, we got to get him out of the building, man. We're taking over the building. Yeah. But uh, no, man, you know, this guy has become like one of my best friends. I mean, it's been what, 12 years? 13. 13 years. This month, actually. It's yeah. And, and it's crazy, man. My dog loves him more than me. And, <laughs> but, uh, and that's the dog there, yeah, Frankie. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this is when we were visiting we were at the Elm, probably about 2015, I think. I looked at 2015, and uh, we had already known each other about four years up by then. Right? Yeah, I didn't know I was that handsome. <laughs> you always are. Charmer <laughs> and handsome. Um, and so um, can we talk a little about a little bit about some of the, even when you were there, like some of the, just the challenges you had to go through. Oh, uh, just living there was uh, like living in San Asylum. <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad, but you, you know, you do have to deal with a lot of people that have mental illness. And it's, it's hard to deal with people, but you know, it taught me a lot about myself and, and caused me to have more self control now. And at first, you mentioned that you landed at the Elm because of this encounter with a friend that talked oh, to yeah, you about yeah, the homeless so outreach team. And so, yeah. talk a little bit about um, what you started to think about and how you re engaged with them. What happened was, after I went with my friend to support her <laughs> and got housed myself, I was like, man, that's what I want to do with my life. You know, it's like be able to help people like that have them kind type of resources to uh, work for a company like the Homeless Outreach and be able to, to offer that to people. And so that's what I pursued. And the lady who was running the hot team, she saw how my life had changed from coming and seeing me at the hotel. And uh, she ended up, I said, she said, I'll give you a chance, you know. And uh, so they, they ended up hiring me. You guys worked there for eight years. 
So I couldn't have done it though if it, if he hadn't come and encouraged me, talked to me every every like week that they came. Man, it was just like always something good. Um, the food wasn't really good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but uh you know i got to meet his family and, uh, what a wonderful family wonderful person he is, you know? it's crazy it's crazy i would have never met him if he hadn't ended up joining that program so, yeah. so look why don't you tell folks who aren't familiar with the hot team a little bit about your role like i know that you started in different positions within the hot team, and, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that, just to help, help inform people about what are some of the services. Um, well, basically, my my job with the hot team, I had a whole bunch of people out in Golden Gate that were camping in the park. Great. So that, by the beach, the windows, down there, in Golden Gate, all through Golden Gate. Um, my job was to go and interact with these people and to help them to want housing because most of them were like pretty happy just living out there in the woods, you know, for free and being able to spend a check, you know, whatever they wanted. So they became adapt adaptive to, to living out there. So my job, what I thought my job was basically to talk to them and try to get them back into life, you know, to get them back into society, you know. And with God's help, I was able to one guy was in, living in the park for 25 years, and I was able to get him into housing. I mean, he, yeah. And I think, Rick, that just didn't happen overnight. I think I remember you telling me that you would drive into Gray Park looking for some of these people you began to meet and talk to, and you built a relationship with some of these people who were living yeah. in the park. It was a lot of coffee. <laughs> a lot of coffee, a lot of encouragement. And, uh, and he would... Uh, he would tell me why he can't do it, you know, and I, I would, you know, break it down, you know, whatever his excuse was, I would end up overcoming his excuse, and then he would have another one pop up, and then I would, finally, one day, he just gave up and said, you know what, <laughs> I'm going to just go ahead and try it, man, and uh, so he went for like one week, and he just ended up staying in there, so. Good job, good work, good work, dude. Yeah, and so I know you did that for numbers of people and through the hot team and through your attendance and helping you. Um, so talk a little bit about this year. I know this year was a, a big year for you. Um, so talk about what happened. <clears throat> it was in like January. January, I was in a scooter accident. I didn't have a helmet on. I was going like 15 miles an hour down Jones right before you turn on McAllister. Uh, and then and just out the blue, I flew head over my uh, scooter and hit a, a bump in the road, a pothole that was pretty deep, and ended up passing out. And when they got me to the hospital, they took out the skull, and uh, my brain was bleeding. So, you know, they had to repair that. And they sent a piece of my, my skull to uh, Virginia without me. <laughs> So he like went on vacation, left me in the hospital, you know, and uh, then it came back and they put it back in. And uh, I'm like, man, I remember that phone call, right? And yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I guess I'm gonna believe this, man. Because I got a, I get a phone call one afternoon, and it's from some a surgeon at, at General saying, um, "We want your consent because your friend Rick has just gotten to an accident, and can you give consent?" For, for him to receive surgery to help this bleeding in his brain. And, and so with the stories that Patty shared, with the stories that Bill shared, like so many um, in the Timberline, in, the, in our city, maybe next door to you, don't have family here. And so sometimes we are that community, you and the neighbor next to you, like Rick. And so I, I'm honored that I was able to get involved. I was absolutely me. amazed at how many people knew about me being in the accident and being in the hospital i had people from everywhere my brother who i was estranged from you know we had a a, a blow a blowout way back when i came to live with him and, and over we, 15 years yeah over 15 years and we just didn't talk after that and uh next thing i know man i thought i was seeing an apparition <laughs> I'm, not, 
I thought I had I crossed over to the other side because I seen him walking into my hospital room, you know, and, and it was amazing, man. And, uh, and then after that, I was able to fly out and spend time when I met my niece and nephews yeah. for the first time. First time yeah. ever. Yeah. And so, and so I want to also uh, tell the other part of your story, and that is, um, it wasn't just me. It wasn't just me. One other two other people, two or three other people that came around, Rick, but it was another executive director of another organization called um, a Faithful Fools in Tenderloin, who had Rick's phone after it was found by this person who called the police. And so um, with that, he, uh, we were able to get in touch with, uh, with Tommy, who then flew from Arkansas, and as Rick said, it was, he thought it was a ghost, but it was his real brother. So I had a chance to reconnect <laughs> with him. And so Rick, just to wrap up, um, tell people what's gonna happen this year next. Oh yeah, on Thanksgiving I'm going back for ten days to see my brother. So and my nephew, Tough. niece and nephew. Be the first Thanksgiving with his family that he never had. Yeah, it's one thing to be around uh people that are your family because you call them in your family, you know. But I was always raised not around my family but around other people. So it was like it was like really special for me to be around my real blood, you know, it was amazing, man, to be around your real blood, you know. It's gonna be a great Thanksgiving. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. I know, I know. You too. <laughs> you too. You too. But it, so, it is amazing. You have to admit, you know, it's like. So in those four months, I'll wrap up. I know we only have a little few seconds. But during those four months, he was in the hospital. Other people in the community watched his three dogs. You didn't mention anything about his three dogs. Were her three boys? Four months, you guys. Someone to care for his dogs and, and love them. So we thank you. So I want to just say thank you, Rick, for coming up here, just bravely sharing your story. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to me. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Right.